Hey there, uh, welcome to That Dang Dad, my name is Phil. Tonight, I want to discuss a challenge I'm seeing in the modern world, and to begin, regrettably, we must briefly talk about... <sighs> Bean Dad. For those who missed it, the Bean Dad saga began with the musician John Roderick weaving a delightful yarn about how, when his nine-year-old daughter was hungry, he forced her to learn how to open a can of beans with an old-school can opener. She didn't understand the mechanics of the can opener, and Roderick took great glee in refusing to do it for her, coaching her to figure it out herself instead. He claimed it took her six hours to finally get the can open. His reason for this is that he was actually teaching her resourcefulness and self-reliance, and that... In the future, she was now better equipped to solve her own problems. You probably heard what happened next. Roderick's story set off an outrage cluster bomb that resulted in him deleting his account, his music being removed from a popular podcast, and friends of his disavowing him publicly to varying degrees. He later apologized and claimed that his story was largely exaggerated as part of a gruff, doomsday prepper type persona that he puts on. But the damage was done, and his brand still has a lot of stink on it. Lots of people commenting on the story brought up their own histories with parents who played mind games with them, shattered their confidence, broke their trust, or were otherwise emotionally abusive in similar situations. While those experiences were heartbreaking and infuriating, I kept coming back to an admittedly lesser tragedy laying amongst the rubble. The motivation behind Roderick's bean crime, at least in his telling of it, was... Half right? Uh, don't get me wrong, badgering a hungry nine-year-old for hours is awful parenting and a surefire way to ruin your relationship with your kids. However, he wasn't wrong to want his daughter to learn some resilience and some problem solving. Those are great traits to have that will serve anyone well for the rest of their life. And actually, helping a person learn how to learn is one of the greatest gifts you can give someone. Those of you who have learned a programming language or a martial art know this. Once you've learned one, you can learn others much faster. So yeah, Roderick's hard-ass persona believed in something good, teaching a child problem-solving, while simultaneously believing something bad, that the best way to do this was through six hours of emotional abuse. The Bean Dad saga is an ultimately silly example of this, but lately, I've been very troubled by much more sinister versions. It's about to get pretty dark, so buckle up. You know, like you do when it gets dark. On January 6, 2021, thousands of Republicans were whipped into a frenzy by Donald Trump and his cadre of sycophantic douche clowns into assaulting the United States Capitol. Some simply showed up to scream and shout. Others showed up with guns and homemade explosives. The riot would leave at least five dead and the country shaken. Some of the rioters were typical Republican diehards with heads full of nonsense served up by the hacks on Fox News and Newsmax and OAN. Many believed that Democrats, Russia, China, George Soros, and Seath the Scale as hacked voting machines and altered the outcome of the 2020 election. Beyond that, this distrust is fueled by a belief that big government doesn't care about the average American and is willing to use every dirty trick in the book to retain power. Other rioters were affiliated with the QAnon movement, a Christo-fascist cult who believe that global elites are part of a cannibal pedophile ring harvesting adrenochrome from children for use in satanic rituals. QAnon has a lot of overlap with the broader anti-Semitism movement. Many anti-Semites around the globe believe that a cabal of Jewish banking families secretly controls world governments and uses that influence to undermine Western values or breed white people out of existence or any number of other nefarious plots. Anti-Semitic conspiracy theories were one of the justifications for the Holocaust, but sadly over a half a century later, Many people still believe that Jewish folks have bad intentions for their communities. Conspiracy theorists don't just see Jewish plots all around the globe. Some don't believe in a globe at all. Flat earthers have enjoyed a renaissance in the 2010s, with more people than ever asking the tough questions about our terrestrial topography. 
If you ask a flat earther to explain their worldview, you often arrive at this thesis. Governments and big business are using their influence to manipulate scientific data and hide the truth from people. This line of thinking also shows up in the anti-vax conspiracy movement. The idea that big pharma is lying to you about the effects of their drugs in order to boost profits and make people sicker so they need more medicine. Before I move on, I just want to be very clear here. There is absolutely no evidence of election tampering. No evidence that Hillary Clinton is part of a satanic cult. No evidence that Jewish bankers secretly control the world. No evidence of white genocide. No evidence the world is flat and no evidence that vaccines cause autism. These are dangerous lies made up by grifters and paranoiacs, and they can have real, deadly consequences. That said, again, I see a bit of a tragedy here because a lot of these people are, in a weird kind of way, half right. For example, anti-vaxxers are wrong that vaccines cause autism but they are right that Big Pharma is a wretched hive of scum and villainy that profits by keeping people sick and by keeping drugs expensive. Look at the Sackler family, Elizabeth Holmes, Martin Shkreli, absolutely evil people who got very rich thanks to for-profit predatory health care. In a similar kind of way, flat earthers are wrong about the topography of our pale blue dot but they are correct that governments and big business frequently pay for studies and manipulate data to mislead the public. The tobacco and the sugar industry are famous examples of corporations manipulating public health research with their fat wallets. And of course others are doing it to this day. One of the most dangerous examples of modern half rightistry for those of us on the left is definitely anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Anti-Semites are wrong about a Jewish cabal secretly running the world, but their distrust of the banking and finance industries has merit, not because of Jews, but because of the inherent excesses and contradictions of capitalism. Unfortunately, sometimes leftists can get, uh, let's say clumsy when critiquing corporations and banks, and they can end up regurgitating phrases and images used by anti-Semites. When talking about corporate political power, we probably shouldn't be talking about shadowy cabals. And I would even say that calling landlords parasites is getting a little close to language that was used to justify genocide not too long ago. Those of us opposed to predatory capitalism, which is all capitalism, have to be careful to be extremely precise in our critiques, lest we contribute to oppression against Jewish folks around the world. The other place this phenomenon really bothers me is when I look out across the faces of the January 6th Republican rioters. Let me be clear, the January 6th riots were conducted by a white fascist mob fantasizing about an even crueler version of the United States than we already live in. But part of what animated that mob was a belief that the American government no longer serves the people, and that politicians will rally around their pedophile millionaire friends to prevent justice from being served. And I hate to say it, but they ain't wrong. Our elected representatives don't work for us. They work for the corporations that line their pockets. They work for lobbyists and defense contractors and, uh, yeah, rich finance bros. And as Jeffrey Epstein and Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey and Jimmy Seville and, 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 and prove, many of our politicians don't care about sexual violence committed by wealthy elites as long as they can profit from it. Again, I'm not saying this justifies the Republican violence at the Capitol, only that the mob had seized on a single piece of a very real and much bigger puzzle. The reason I'm bothered by this is because in some ways, I think it can almost be more difficult to get people back on track when they are partially right, but in a dangerous way. You can picture Bean Dad staring out at the vitriol caused by his story and firing back with, Oh sure, I should just let my kids get whatever they want the second they want it. No wonder your generation is so entitled. Because to the bean parents of the world, their unhealthy behavior logically follows from a belief that seems pretty well founded. They want good things for their kids, and this seems to be the way to do it. Or think of one of the capital rioters, maybe someone who owned a business that went belly up in the 2008 Wall Street greed orgy, and then just as they were starting to recover, they got hosed again by the 2020 pandemic. 
Maybe they were a coal miner who got abused by well-connected mining companies before being let go unceremoniously, while their abusive CEO went on to become, I don't know, governor of West Virginia? These are people who feel ignored and mocked by both politicians and the media. No wonder they get sucked into cesspits like Parlor and PragerU. These places put a flattering narrative behind their unflattering treatment. When someone has their ear and says, Those rich coastal elites hate your guts, and they're laughing at your values. Voting for Trump would really shake things up. Storming the Capitol will show them that you're not to be ignored. You can see how that bad behavior feels like a logical extension of valid hurt. So this creates a real challenge for those of us who would like to see people stop believing in these dangerous ideas. For one thing, it means the opposition to these people is now split between those of us who affirm a structural issue but have a different interpretation of it versus those who think the structure is just fine. The latter tend to be those benefiting from the structure and thus are the louder, wealthier, and more well-connected voices. So someone all frothed up about Hillary Clinton being a corrupt politician who drinks children's blood is much more likely to hear neoliberals shouting back that, no, actually Hillary is a yas queen girl boss, instead of hearing us saying, yeah, the Clintons are a corrupt family, that's why we need to abolish these unjust hierarchies and uh, expropriate their ill-gotten wealth. Someone concerned that Bill Gates is putting tracking chips in vaccines is only going to hear from wealth fetishists cooing about Bill Gates being a benevolent billionaire philanthropist, instead of those of us saying, yeah, Gates and his foundation are wildly corrupt and they're using philanthropy as a cover for profiteering, and that's why we need to uh, expropriate their ill-gotten wealth and reinvest it in our struggling communities. So, instead of hearing a structural critique that accurately explains the frustrations they're having, these people are only hearing structural apologia that denies their lived experience, and that's only going to push them deeper into the nastiest communities on the internet. This half-right plague also puts those of us with systemic critiques in an awkward spot when it comes to de-radicalization. On the one hand, part of me wants to be like, Ah, they're 20% of the way there. If we can just bring them in, shove a copy of Capital in their hand, make them watch Sorry to Bother You, we'll have them marching with BLM in no time. On the other hand, a lot of their behaviors and attitudes are dangerous and put marginalized members in our spaces at risk. I'm not going to ask trans comrades to spend some of their limited energy reserves re-educating someone who threatens to assault them for using the bathroom. I'm not going to ask black comrades to take someone out to lunch who believes that black people have lower IQs than white people. And I'm not going to ask disabled comrades to invest in people who think eugenics is a valid strategy for society. So... what do? I don't know, man. I just noticed this shit. I don't know what to do about it. In all seriousness, I think the idea I'm starting to take away from this is that projects of de-radicalization and social justice are not one-size-fits-all, that they're going to have to be multiple entry points out there leading people back to a more just world. I want to do a longer video about this at some point, but in short, my degree is in marketing, and until recently, I was on a team of digital B2B marketers at my company, helping produce content designed to appeal to some of the largest companies in the United States. One of the lessons marketers know is that every member of the great big audience out there is at a slightly different place in the buyer's journey. Some people don't know they have a problem. Some people know that they have one, but they don't know how to solve it. Some people know how to solve it, but they don't know that your organization provides that solution in a way that works for them. So a marketing strategy must have entry points that will appeal to all these different kinds of prospects. In the same way, I think we need to continue to diversify our approaches, luring people back out of harmful ideas about the world. Some people don't know they're being exploited. Some people know that they are, but they're wrong about who's doing the exploitation. And some people know who's exploiting them, but they don't know what to do about it. So we need videos, streamers, podcasts, writers out there presenting answers to these questions at various levels of complexity. Those of you who love to talk about the MCM Prime cycle for two hours straight, Awesome, keep it up. But we also need diverse voices starting from places other than thick books written by dead white guys. 
Those of you who love to demolish reactionaries with facts and logic and creative insults, great, keep it up. But we also need people with gentler approaches if we want to pique the curiosity of people who are tired of being mocked by the rich and powerful. I am not saying we need to ally with the Proud Boys or tell racist jokes to win over the white working class. All I'm saying is that one person's Lindsay Ellis might be someone else's American Johnson. One person's, uh, Bioshock might be another person's Night in the Woods? I don't know, that got away from me there. What I'm really getting at is that those of you watching this, those of you that aren't awaiting trial for the Capitol riots anyway, probably believe that a kinder, more just world is possible. If you've made it this far, you probably believe in creating a world that preserves dignity, safeguards the health and well-being of others, and empowers the powerless. My call to action coming out of this discussion is that all of us have a role to play in winning that world. Some of us need to work on direct de-radicalization, be that through conversations, video essays, or... Ugh, debates. Some of us need to work on the part of the pipeline that educates newbies about concepts and theories that veterans take for granted. Some of us need to be the relationship builders helping newbies feel connected to the broader movement. Some of us need to do that deep dive shit that gets nerds all excited and advances the scholarship. And some of us need to educate the educators. For example, I've had some great conversations with disabled comrades who've pointed out many ways that ostensibly liberatory content still excludes them. And lastly, I firmly believe that some of us need to bring the fun. Nobody wants to join a movement of mopey sad sacks who only complain. As anarchist activist Emma No Queens No Girl Bosses Goldman said, I did not believe that a cause which stood for a beautiful ideal for anarchism, for release and freedom from convention and prejudice, should demand the denial of life and joy. I insisted that our cause could not expect me to become a nun, and that the movement would not be turned into a cloister. If it meant that, I did not want it. I want freedom, the right to self-expression, and everybody's right to beautiful, radiant things. I don't know what it takes to win back someone seduced by QAnon or Trump or flat eartherism. I don't know what they need to hear to unlock the shackles around their minds. What I know is that there was a time in my life that I believed some really toxic things about the world, and I made some really toxic choices. But gradually, I began to hear the voices of people who believed in a better world. Some of them were people in my real life. Some of them were books and movies. And many of them were YouTubers. It took many years, but I'm proof you can teach an old chud new tricks. So get out there and start that Twitch channel, make that fan art, write that manuscript, that song, that game dialogue, or email that friend who won't get rid of Facebook. Makeup tutorials, Python lessons, fitness blogs. I don't know what your special contribution will be. I just know that we can't do this without you. So what do you think? Uh, what's your calling here? What entry points do you think are missing that we'll need to bring people over to a healthier worldview? What entry points rescued you from a lifetime of chuddery? Let us know in the comments. Make sure you like, subscribe, ring the bell, dingle the dangle. Actually, the thing I hope you do most is just uh, share this video with people that you think might find it interesting. Uh, anyway, thanks for joining me. I hope I didn't say anything too out of line tonight. It can be hard to talk about de-radicalization in ways that don't sound like, we just need to be understanding to the Nazis. So I hope you heard this in the spirit in which I wrote it. But please let me know if I beefed it in the comments. On that note, I must take my leave. Thanks again for spending time with me tonight, and I hope to see you on the next one. Good night.